Hello everyone and welcome to video lecture of uh, chapter 30. The subject of the chapter is electromagnetic induction. Uh, in some books uh, it's called Faraday law of induction. Uh, before I get into the chapter, uh, let's just look at the course schedule in the course and I believe this is, uh, we have one more chapter and we'll be done with the course. So we are currently right now here this week. Uh, you are taking the midterm. Uh, today is Sunday. Uh, so you are uh, taking the midterm as of uh, 4.26 here. Uh, so next week we begin on, or this tomorrow, we'll begin on chapter 30. And then uh, the following week uh, we will uh, finish the last chapter of the semester, and that is electromagnetic uh, fields and waves. Kind of a fun chapter. It's one of my favorite subjects. And then uh, that's it. Then we will uh, have the final exam, I believe, the following week, I, um, I think. Uh, I, I, in, until this point, I haven't heard from the school uh, how the final exam is going to be conducted, unless I haven't, uh, I, I missed one of the emails or something. But I will let you know by next week or maybe this week how the exam is going to be conducted. Of course, most likely it's going to be online and uh, and most likely, I'm predicting, is going to be just like the uh, midterm exam. It's just going to be, uh, you know, I, I told you, the final is just going to be another, uh, you know, similar to the midterm, except it's uh, uh, accumulative. Uh, I'll give you all these details uh, either this coming week or most likely next week. I'll have more information to give you. Okay? All right. Uh, back to the chapter. Um, Please, before you listen to this lecture, do me a favor, do yourself a favor, and read the entire chapter. It's really a good idea to read the chapter, get yourself familiar with the content, okay? And then come back and watch this video. Because The reason is because I don't have the, I cannot do it in one hour to, uh, to give you all the content of the chapter plus solving some problem. There is no way that I could do that in one hour, one and a half hour or so. So that's just uh, too much for me. So uh, my concentration mainly is working out exercises. Those exercises include examples from my, uh, you know, from uh, from the book and from my uh, lecture notes. And maybe I'll do a couple of uh, homework problems. I have a, at least two of them. One of them is sounds kind of hard to some of you, so I'm going to be working on that as well. Okay. All right. Uh, so what is electromagnetic induction? Uh, let's get into it. So imagine, here is how it works. Uh, it was, I believe, the, the induction was discovered by Faraday, Michael Faraday. Imagine you have a loop of wire that looks something like that. Okay, that's a loop of wire. And I'm going to take this loop and connect it to an emitter, okay? So here is an emitter. I'll just make it into a box like that. And then the emitter has a dial, right? And here is the needle. You know what I mean? There's a reading here. You know what I mean? Here is the ammeter. And as you can see, the loop had, doesn't have a power source. Okay? There is no battery connected to it or anything. Obviously, the ammeter is going to read zero. Right? There's no current there. It's just going to read zero here. Right? Now, imagine that I have a bar magnet, just like that. And let's assume this is the north pole and this is the south. And I'm going to hold it in my hand. Okay? And I'm going to bring it or move it towards uh, the loop, okay? Something really strange happens, almost like magic. What will happen, I will notice that the the emitter, here is the needle, I'm mean, let's magnify it a little bit better, here it is, okay? This is the emitter dial. What's going to happen, as I move it in this direction, this needle is going to move in one direction, say here. In other words, indicating there is a current of some value, okay? Even though the loop is not connected to a power source, okay? Now, if I take the same bar magnet and now I move it in the opposite direction, say this way, okay? What's going to happen is that the needle is going to move in the opposite direction this way, okay? Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, and, and in other words, it's, it's, it's telling me that there exists, let me go back to the original, and let's assume it's going this way, okay? So it's telling me that there exists a current, okay? We call it induced current, I sub I and D. Later on, we're going to remove this index. There is an induced current in the circuit, okay? So what's going on here? Now, it took uh, Faraday and others, 
you know, many years until they figure out what's what's going on here. Here is how it works. Again, I'm being very brief. Your book goes on in details for pages and pages on that. Uh, you can read the first page, page 837, and some other, and then the one that follow on that. But anyway, so what happened is the following. Here is the loop, okay? Let's ignore the emitter for now. Assume the emitter is there, but it's invisible, all right? And here is the magnet, the bar magnet, okay? Of course, this is north and south. And as you know, if I have a bar magnet, north and south, the, current, the, the magnetic field whoops, goes in that direction like that, right? It goes out of the north into the south, correct? Like that, right? So what's going on here is that you're going to have this, here is a magnetic field. I can draw it much better on the board, but anyway. Here is a magnetic field going this way. Of course, it's going to loop back to the south, but that's how it looks like, right? And so on, okay? So this is the magnetic field. So what's happening as you bring it closer and closer to the loop, okay? As you bring, maybe I should use my mouse so you can see what's going on. As I bring the magnet closer and closer to the loop, okay, what's happening is that the flux, remember the word flux in Gauss's law? I am increasing the flux. I'm increasing the flow of the magnetic field into the, into the loop. What counts here is the motion, okay, in other, or the change in the flux, okay? What is flux, if you remember? Let's go back to flux. Phi. Remember, uh, Gauss's law says Ea. Remember that? Well, we have something similar, flux, and I remember I told you we're going to do it in um, for mag magnetism. It's Ba uh, cosine theta. Okay? Uh, where B is, of course, is the magnetic field. A is the area of the loop. Okay? And theta is the angle. Okay? The angle of the normal. Remember, if you have a... Here is, uh, here is the loop right here. Here is the area, the vector of the area is right there, right? And the magnetic field is this way. See what I'm saying? So now if there is an angle between them, so here, is, sorry, uh, let me go back. Ah, I messed it up, I'll do it again. So here is, here is a loop, here is the, sorry, here is the area, right? And so the vector of the area is this way, the area vector. And let's assume that the magnetic field is in this direction, assume. So this angle between them. Is that cosine angle okay all right so the flux here the magnetic flux phi sub b again I'm gonna drop that uh, b again the, the index but that's basically what the flux is equal to okay the flux is b a cosine theta now what does that mean it means the following um, as I bring the, the the bar magnet closer and closer okay what's happening is that the magnetic field b it's getting more intense, okay? In other words, it's all about change, okay? It's getting more intense. And so you have what is called Faraday law. He says there will be an induced EMF voltage that is equal to d phi over dt. There is an absolute value there, okay? So it is the change in the magnetic flux with respect to time. You got that? So if phi is equal to this, so what does that mean? If I take it as a derivative, so the induced EMF, this voltage, induced voltage, okay, is going to be d, d, let me, let me drop the, the absolute for now. So it's going to be b a cosine theta, okay? Now, what's changing here for this case, for the case of the magnet, the bar magnet going closer to the loop? What's changing is the intensity of the magnetic field. As you get closer and closer, the magnetic field is getting more intense, correct? However, the area of the loop is constant, and the orientation is constant, right? So I can kick them out of the integral, uh, the, the derivative. So it's going to be b, uh, sorry, it's going to be a cosine theta, which is a constant, db dt. And there we go. Here is the EMF, okay? I mean, this is, of course, for this case specifically, okay? So then I can, I can now find using Ohm's law, well, I know Ohm's law says what? V equals IR, or for our notation, the EMF is equal to IR. So the induced current I is equal to the EMF over R. 
So the induced current I is equal to A cosine theta over R times dB dt. There we go. In other words, going back to this page, right, to the, to the, to the top of the page, this induced current right here, what's the value of it? Well, the value of it is this one. Okay? What is it? It's basically A, the area of the loop, and you have the, uh, let me use a different color. You have the area of the loop, which is, say, given to us. I know the resistance in the, in the wire. Okay, the wire has a certain resistance. I can calculate from the resistivity of the wire. Say it's copper. I can calculate that, right? And then, uh, and then you have cosine theta. Well, cosine theta, the angle between them is zero, right? I mean, for that matter, because the the bar magnet is uh, is parallel. Uh, the angle between the two here it is right there. Here is a right this way, and b is this way for our case. So the angle between them is zero, and therefore cosine zero is one. Okay, and then the only thing is that I need to know, I have I need to have an expression for how the magnetic field is changing with T. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so base, that's basically an a, an expression for the induced current. You got it? Okay. Now another way. Here is another scenario for you. Imagine that I have here is the current. Let me go back to black color. <clears throat> Imagine I have here is the current loop right there. Uh, yeah, the current loop. Okay, or the loop of wire that is. Imagine that the loop of wire is uh, is attached to a uh, a, uh, a base here where it is able to spin. Let's say spin like that. Okay, and let's say I have a bar magnet here, and the bar magnet is not moving. Okay, so but this one is spinning. So what's happening here? Well, as far as here is the magnetic field, well, the magnetic field is not changing because the bar magnet is not getting closer or further. But the area here is changing. You agree with me on that? So in this case, when I use the uh, the EMF, which is d phi dt, it becomes remember phi is what is uh, uh, what is phi? Phi is equal to uh, b a cosine theta, right? So what's happening here is that because the orientation is changing, so you have the angle is changing. You got that? Make sense? So in this case, it becomes something like uh, B A uh, D D T of cosine theta, which makes it uh, minus sine theta, and so on. Okay. Another scenario: Imagine that um, I have the loop of wire. Here it is. And let's assume somehow the loop of wire is expanding in area, expanding in all directions like that. Let's say it's like a rubber band. So now it's getting bigger, or it's getting smaller, whatever. You know, it's expanding, stretching. So in this case, the area is changing and so on, okay? Anyway, so I, I don't want to dwell too much on that, but that's how you have, how you could have a, uh, a changing EMF, uh, a changing flux, excuse me, okay? So this E is D phi dt. Here you're dealing with three variables, B, A, and theta. You could have, you could change the magnetic field intensity. You could change the area. Or you can change the orientation, which makes it theta here, like this one here, okay? And or you can do a power combination of uh, of those, which we're not going to study that much. But anyway, uh, I hope you got the idea. All right. Let me give you a, a quick example to show you how this works. Um, I have an example from my notes here. Here it is. It says uh, a coil consists of <clears throat> consists of 200 turns. Oh, I, I forgot to talk about turns. Anyway, 200 turns. I'll tell you what that means in a sec. Of wire um, square, and the wire is square in shape of side 18 centimeter. And there is a uniform magnetic field B that is perpendicular to the plane of the loop. Okay, so far? Okay, uh, now here's what happens. The field, the magnetic field that is, uh, changes uh, from 0 to 0 0.5 Tesla 
in uh, 0.8 seconds. Okay. Here's the question. What is the magnitude of the induced induced EMF E while field is changing? While field we say field it means magnetic field, right? Is changing. All right. Okay. How do we do it? First of all, let me just uh, show you something. So we said that the EMF is equal to d phi dt. Now, without the absolute value, there is actually a minus sign there. The minus indicates resistance to change in flux. Okay. You can read about it in the book. So that means the resistance to the change in flux. But we, uh, I tend to ignore it for now. Uh, it's, it doesn't really, uh, uh, and I also uh, ignore the the, uh, the absolute value. But it's always there in my mind, okay? So when I don't put the absolute value, it's always there, okay? So um, now, if the change in the flux is linear, such as this problem here, see here you have, it changes from 0 to 0.5, from just this point to this point, that's it. It's not a continuous change, you know what I mean? Like the next example I'm going to show you, okay? So it becomes like this, E, it becomes delta phi over delta T, in other words, uh, something like phi final minus phi initial over delta t. You know what I mean? That's the meaning of it. So if it's linear in that sense, just give you two numbers. What's the final value of the magnetic field? What's the initial value of the magnetic field? You can just use this one and say, uh, you be done with it over that time period that he gives, which is 0.8 second. Got it so far? One more thing. Now, if I have a loop of wire, here is a loop of wire that we're dealing with. But it doesn't really look like this. It actually looks like this. There are 200 turns. In other words, there are 200 wires, loops. You see what I'm saying? In this case, the EMF, the general form for it, let me start with this one here. It becomes N d phi dt. In other words, you actually multiply the number of turns, n, okay? Simple. Same thing here. You just put that n in there. If the number of turns is not 1, so it's more than that. You get that? Okay. In other words, you can actually increase the EMF, the value of the EMF, by simply increasing the number of turns, which is cool. All right? So let's do our problem now. How do we do it? We can do it just in one line. So we have the EMF, which is, again, I'm going to use this form right there. So that's going to be the, uh, well, Sorry, I'm a little bit out of myself. Hold on. Let, let, let me get the phi first. So what's the value of the phi here? Well, phi is equal to uh, B A cosine theta. He said that perpendicular to the field, which means that B and A are parallel, correct? Makes sense? So uh, remember, the area field is perpendicular to the, to the uh, it's a normal it's area to the area. So that makes it 1. Uh, the theta here is 0. That's what I'm saying. So basically, you're dealing with this, okay? So now, phi, I'm running out of space. I hope you've written the exam, the problem already. So in this case, the EMF is going to be something like this. Phi uh, final minus phi initial over delta T. Well, what is phi final? Well, it is B final, A, A is constant, it's not changing, minus B initial, A, over delta t. Is that right? Okay. So EMF is equal to, what's the B final? He said it's 0.5 Tesla, right? Times uh, uh, minus, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, how about if I, hold on, hold on. I want to take this A as a common factor. Divide by delta t, that's easier, right? So in this case, I'm going to do, the area is what he said, the area dimension is, um, 18 centimeter, so 0 0.8, 0 0.18 times 0 0.18, right? So it's going to be uh, 0.18 squared times B final, 0.5, minus 0 over the time uh, is uh, 0.5 seconds, 0.8 seconds. So that's 0.8 seconds here. And there we go. We just calculate that. I think I have it over here. Oh, I forgot the 200 turns. Sorry. 
right? Times 200 turns. There we go. So now we have, um, let me calculate it. I hope you are working with me. So uh, 0.18 uh, squared times 0.5 uh, divided by 0.8 times 200. Answer, 4.05, 4.1 I got in my notes. So 4.1 uh, volt. So I have generated 4.5 volt without a battery. You see what I'm saying? All right. Now, if he asked, what is the induced VMA? Excuse me, the induced current. Well, current is just Ohm's law. Uh, of course, provided that he gives us. Did he give us the uh, resistors? He didn't. But let's assume this is actually the second part of the problem. Uh, part B, if R is equal to two ohm. What is the con what is the induced current? Okay, so in this case it will be 4.1 over 2, and that will be equal to roughly uh, 2 amp. So you have a, a current going through it with uh, 2 amp. You got that, guys? Okay. Let's do something a little bit more complicated. This is probably the kind of problem that you studied in high school when it comes to induced current. All right. Uh, he says you have a loop of wire. Uh, of area A, re, uh, placed in a region of magnetic field that is perpendicular to A, to the plane of the loop, which means parallel uh, to the normal plane of the loop. And here's the thing. B varies in time according to the following formula, according to B equals B naught E to the minus alpha T, okay? Where alpha here is a constant, okay? Here's the question is, find the induced EMF. Got it? Well, first of all, if I want to get the induced EMF, I know the induced EMF is nothing but d phi dt. I need to find phi. Well, phi is what? The, for, the official formula for it, the formal thing, is b a cosine theta. Well, cosine theta is 1, right? Because it said perpendicular to the loop of the wire, to the plane of the loop, which makes the theta equal 0 to the normal, right? So in this case, just b a. Well, b is this. Plug it in, so I'm going to have A, B naught, E to the minus alpha T, right? Uh, so the EMF in this case, it becomes, um, if I insist on putting a minus sign there, again, you put it for convenience, so D phi DT, and that will be uh, minus, take the derivative, right? So minus D DT of A, B naught, E to the minus alpha T, and that's equal to, uh, it will give me plus alpha A B naught E to the minus alpha T, correct? So as you can see here, it says, so uh, you have the, the magnetic field here depends on the, uh, depends, as time goes by, it drops down exponentially. You see what I'm saying? Let me, let me make a drawing of that to show you what that means. If I'm going to draw just the magnetic field with time, I mean, what's going on here? Why, why did I put that minus sign? I'll tell you why. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll show you. So this is T and this is B of T. What's happening here, the magnetic field is not increasing. It's actually decreasing in time. Make sense? Because that's a, this is a decay, E to the minus alpha T. That's an exponential decay. So we're starting at T equals zero with a value of B naught, which is really large. And then at, uh, it is tapering down exponentially in, a, in a, an exponential decay like that. It's asymptotic. Got it? So that's basically B naught E to the minus alpha T. Of course, the steepness of the curve, remember we started the RC circuit, the steepness of the curve is determined by the value of alpha. You know, like the time constant, remember that? 
All right. What about the EMF? Well, it's the same thing. Look at that. It's exactly the same thing. The EMF looks something like that as well. Here is the uh, <clears throat> here is the time axis right here. This is the EMF as a function of time as well. Look at that. It's a function of time. So starting with E naught. What's E naught? Well, E naught is really that. Right? That's E naught right here. So that's alpha A B naught. And then it is tapering down exponentially like this, just like this one, okay? And with the same steepness because it is alpha, the same uh, decay constant, if you will. Alpha is a decay constant, right? So it is the same steepness going down like that exponentially and then asymptotically it doesn't touch it. You see what I'm saying? And there we go. You got it, guys? Okay. Okay, awesome. The next topic that I want to talk about is... Uh, motional emf not emotional emf emf motional it's from the word motion motional emf this is section two kind of a cool uh, section uh, 30.2 okay Gotta have my coffee. Okay, uh, let me give you the following scenario. Imagine I have a um, a bar or um, a conductor. Okay, say a metal conductor, a bar that looks like that. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna place it in a magnetic field region. So imagine the magnetic field region is all through here. And look at the direction of the magnetic field region. It's into the page, correct? Okay. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to be moving the bar of the conductor is in, in this direction. Okay. Remember, the bar is not connected to any... Uh, it's not connected to any... Uh, power source or anything like that but it's a conductor remember it's say made out of copper silver gold whatever okay what's going to happen is if i pick i mean remember if it's a conductor that he means it has a a, a a lot of valence electrons remember we talked about valence electrons so it has a lot of valence electrons and what's going to happen if i pick one of the let's say if i pick a positive a, a negative an electron to me right here as it is moving and if you remember uh, if you have a charge let me just uh, review this if i have a charge say positive charge q moving in this direction and there is a magnetic field this way so according to the right hand rule which direction is going to go use the right hand rule and I, we talked about that and it's going to move uh, v cross b this is b right here so uh, and that's going to move in this direction is that right so there will be a force on it in this direction. Yes? Okay. Now, if it's a negative, however, same, exactly the same scenario, except it's negative. Remember, you flip it because it's a negative charge, right? So what's going to happen if I take this to go back to the bar here? If I am moving it in this direction, okay? And so what's going to happen here is that this negative charge, okay, is going to go down. In other words, as I move it further and further, I will see an accumulation of negative charges here, like that. Make sense? Now, if there is a positive charge, let's say there is a positive charge, if I apply the right-hand rule, I will see an accumulation of positive charges here. You get that? Make sense? So what happened here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete those, just because uh, for clarity. Okay, so what's happening, let me just go back to the electron. So what's happening here is that the the electron, this valence is going to be, the force on it is going to be this way, which is F sub B, right? Just like this one here. This is the electron going to be this way. So it's going to be this one. And then there will be also, but because there is positive charge at the top, it will be attracted to this, to this one, to those charges, and that, but that's electrostatically. So there will be electric force. Coulombic. 
you know, electrostatic force, economic force, the good old economic force. So here we have two forces, the magnetic force going down this way and an electric force going down this way. Now, what will happen if I keep moving, if I keep moving the bar this way, and the accumulation of negative and positive charges would continue, if the accumulation of negative charges and positive charges will continue, what can happen eventually is that F sub E will equal to F sub B. Make sense? You will see an equilibrium. And at that moment, the accumulation will stop. Okay? So in other words, what I have done here, I have polarized the bar, this conductor. So this part, uh, on, uh, this part on the top is uh, positive, the one on the, the, the bottom is negative, and it has been polarized uh, the moment when the electrostatic, the Coulombic force, is equal to the magnetic force. Okay? Great. Okay. <clears throat> well, what is the electric force equal to? Well, first of all, before I do that, let me do, use a different color. So now, let me, let me magnify this bar. Okay, I just make it look bigger so I can explain things to you. Here is the bar. Let's make it big and fat. Here it is. Okay. So here I have uh, negative here. And I got positive charges here. And here is our sample electron. You can make it proton. I mean, excuse me, a positive charge, whatever. Okay. So what's going to happen here? You're going to have an electric field going this way. That's the electric. Maybe I should take this to the thing. So you're going to have an electric field going this way. Okay. Now, if I assume that the bar has a length L, so here is the electric field. And if it has a length L, uh, well, whenever there is an electric field, there is a voltage associated with it. And we know that, if you remember E, uh, excuse me, V equals ED. Remember that? ED, ED, or AEL in our case here. Okay, that's the voltage. The voltage across from here to here. There is a voltage, so this is V naught and this is zero. There is a voltage, and that voltage is equal to delta V equal E L. Okay, that's one thing. Now, what else? Well, go back to the electron. So this electron is under two forces: the electrostatic force going this way, F sub B, and then the magnetic force going this way, F sub B. Yes. Okay. Now the electrostatic force. Let me go back to black color. The electrostatic force here would be QE. Remember? Coulomb's law. QE. And the magnetic force is QVB. Yes? See that? It's right here, this QVB. Right? So the Qs cancel out. I end up with a very interesting relation, actually a fundamental equation that we will see again next chapter when we cover electromagnetic waves, it will be E equal CB, C being the speed of light, but also it, this equation pops up again uh, here in electromagnetic uh, theory. So we have E equal VB, and this is how electric field is related to the magnetic field. In other words, they are the same really, except you get that velocity as a multiple, okay? The same manifestation, the same thing. Okay, so we have that, which is a very interesting relationship. Make sure that you are memorize that relationship. You'll see it again later. Now, since the voltage is V equals EL, so I can say that the voltage or the EMF, remember this is this voltage is EMF. You agree with me on that? I mean, that's EMF. This voltage didn't come from the battery. It came from the induction, you know, just by the idea of me moving the bar, okay? The idea of me moving the bar, out of a sudden, I got this induced voltage. I got the induced voltage. I got the induced electric field. All of that is induced. You see what I'm saying? So this E, if we go back, and this is an induced, so it's going to be EL. But E is equal to VB. So basically, I have the induced voltage is equal to BLV. Very interesting relationship. Box it and make sure you're familiar with it. Got it so far? Okay. Let me give you another scenario before we do another uh, uh, some problems. I'm going to come back to our bar here. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to take the same bar, this bar. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it on a rail. Look at this. 
I have a U-shaped rail like this. Okay? Imagine a wire. So a wire that looks like that. Just it takes this shape. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take the same bar, but I'm gonna put it on the rail. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a rail. So I'm going to put it on top of it like that. And then I have the same magnetic field into the page like that. Okay. Same magnetic field B. Okay. And I'm going to move the bar this way. Okay. But this time, of course, I'm going to move the bar with my hand, which means I am exerting a force, applied force, F-A-P-P, -P, applied with my hand. Okay, um, I want to just, I don't like the clutter, but all of that, this is magnetic field everywhere, I got it, okay. All right, so as I move it, well, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is going to be exactly the same situation here. I'm going to have electric, uh, excuse me, uh, positive charging, charges accumulating here, negative charges accumulating here. And what's going to happen just, but look, look at this. Here, the bar is not connected to anything. So what's going to happen? Those charges are just going to accumulate there and sit there until finally F sub B and F sub B are equal. But if I have a rail, a wire, what's going to happen is that I'm going to see a current going through the circuit. Because these charges are going to move through the rail like that. And out of a sudden, I'm going to see a current, an induced current that is. So I'm going to have a current going through the circuit. You see what I'm saying? As I move it in this, remember this is a velocity, and that's the applied force, okay? Now, so this case, I'm going to have a current going this way. This is current I. Maybe I should use a different color. Hold on. So here is, oops, oh, darn it. Bear with me, sorry about that. Like I said, I would rather use chalk. There we go, okay. Now let me change the color. Oop, not this one, this one. How about green? You like green, right? All right, so here is the current going this way. The same current here, okay? All right. You may remember, now, let's, uh, of course, we said that the bar uh, has a length L, right? If you remember, okay? So, if you remember, we also had the following formula. F sub B is equal to I L B, I L cross B. Remember that? Remember this formula? What does it say? Basically, if I have a wire, here it is, of length uh, L, and have a current I, there's a wire of length L, and let's say I L B okay. And let's say, for example, uh, I have a current, excuse me, a magnetic field going into the page like that. So what's going to happen? Use the right hand rule. L cross B. L is this direction, right? L is this way, oh, which is always the direction of the current, by the way. And cross B. So you're going to see a force going this way, right? Okay. Well, let's apply the same thing here. So here I have an induced current right there. Okay, I have an induced current I, and and the current is going in this direction. The magnetic field is into the page. Well, let's use the right hand rule and see what's going to happen. Well, what's going to happen? There will be a force, a magnetic force going this way. In other words, what I'm trying to say is here is my hand. Okay, here is here is my here is my hand. This is applied for it. That's my hand pulling it, figuratively speaking. We're not talking about the real hand. Okay, so what's going to happen as I move it in this direction? I'm going to feel a resistance to my motion. A resistance. Why? Because the induced current have, as a result of that produced a magnetic force in the opposite direction. You see what I'm saying? And we call that F sub B in this call, we call it the magnetic drag. Isn't that interesting?
Okay. All right. Good. What else? So now, as it is moving, what's happening to the area here? What's happening to the area? I'm trying to hear you guys saying things. Of course, I hopefully you will say the area is increasing, correct? The area is increasing. Well, okay. If we assume that the length of the wire, this side here, is L, okay? Same as the length of the bar, okay? And this, this side of the wire is changing, correct? This side is changing. So let's assume, let me match my notes. What did I call it? Um, I'm going to call it, sorry, give me a sec. Uh, if I don't find it, I'll just use my own. Uh, I thought I had it here somewhere. No, now I don't. Just looking at it a minute ago. Uh, anyway, anyway. So let's assume, uh, let's call this X. Okay? So if I am going to, because of this, uh, so what I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what I'm interested in, I want to find the induced EMF. I mean, we can, I want to find, actually, I mean, I want to know what is I here. I want to find a value for it, okay? And, of course, it also depends on F sub B, which is equal to this relationship. So, if I know I, I can find B. Of course, what's given to me is the value of the magnetic field and uh, the L, the length of the this side. Remember, I prepared that, so I know the length of the wire on this side. I don't know this x, okay? Uh, I know the velocity, however. I know this velocity. I Maybe I know the applied force also, okay? So what I want to know, maybe I want to know F sub B here, and I want to know the current. If I know the current, I'll know the F sub B, right? And I also want to know the EMF. Let's say I want to know all of these, okay? Well, how do I do it? Well, go back to Faraday law. Faraday law says the induced EMF is d phi dt in its simplest form we can put a minus an absolute whatever but it's in the simplest form so what is phi here again uh, the magnetic field as you can see is uh, perpendicular to the plane of the loop so therefore the, the theta here is equal to zero so we can ignore that right so we just say ba also b is a constant so what's changing here really is the area correct okay so what's the area is equal to well go back to the area here Again, let me put a different color. So for those of you to see it, how about yellow? Does it show yellow? I never threw, tried yellow. But here is here is the area right here, right? There's the area. Well, what's the area is equal to? Remember, the, the bar is moving in this direction. So the area is constantly increasing. But if I would find an expression for it, whoops, we don't want yellow, do we? So the area in this case, is equal to L X. Think about it for a minute. I hope you understand that. You believe that. L X. Make sense? X is a variable. L is a constant, but L X is a variable. It's changing. Okay. So in this case, phi is equal to B L X. Yes? Okay. So what is the EMF? Well, the EMF is the derivative. D dt of B L X. But, but what? B and L are constant. Yes? Take them out. Uh, B L D dt X. Well, what is that equal to? What's the derivative of X with respect to time? Well, that's the velocity, isn't it? So it's B L V. What is this velocity? The velocity this one this velocity. See what I'm saying? I mean, that's the speed, which is the speed of x changing. The rate of change of x, which is basically v. Make sense? Okay. There we go. And one, so the, therefore the EMF is equal to BLV. Great. Now watch this. BLV, go back, we have already gotten BLV from this scenario. Isn't that interesting? But in a completely different way. You see what I'm saying? Okay. That's why this relationship is important. So now, let me go back. So I, I found that. I found the, 
be a lift. So let me find the, the force, that magnetic drag. Well, if we assume, here is, here is an assumption, another assumption to make things simple. Um, I want the velocity to be constant. Okay, I want the velocity, I don't want to accelerate it. I want the velocity to be constant. What's the condition of having a constant velocity? Okay, the condition is this. Remember we said that, um, I'm sorry, back. Remember we said that you get the applied force. This is the one where I'm, I'm putting, uh, my hand is here and I'm pulling it this way, correct? And as a result of that, I'm getting a magnetic drag, F sub B right here, right? Sorry for the mess, but I hope you get it. Okay, so, so in order for me to get the velocity constant, the force, what, what's a constant velocity? It means acceleration zero which means some of the forces, go back to good old near mechanics, some of the forces equals zero, which makes it that F applied equals F magnetic, right? The, the magnetic drag, that is. So F applied equals to ILB. See what I'm saying? So in other words, if I would pull, go back here, if I would pull the bar with a force that is equal to the magnetic drag ILB, I'm going to have a, a constant velocity. Okay? All right. Now, imagine I have one more thing. Okay? I'm, I'm giving you a lot of scenarios here. Imagine I have um, right here uh, the mouse so we can see what I'm saying here. Imagine right here, I have, say, a light bulb or a resistor. Let me, let, 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 me, let me make up a resistor here, okay? I'm going to take this V out, which is EMF, right? So what I want to do, I'm afraid if I erase this part, the whole thing will erase, so I'm just going to go like this. Here is a light bulb, okay? Imagine I have a light bulb. There it is. Boom. There we go. Okay, and then I have this light bulb. Of course, there is a current going through it. Remember, there is a current going through it, and that is EMF. We just calculated it's equal to BLV, right? Here it is. There's all kind of stuff going on uh, as I move as I move the the bar this way. Again, no battery whatsoever. Okay, so what's going to happen to this light bulb? Well, it's going to light because there is a current going through it. I mean, if it's a low wattage light bulb, it's going to light up. So here you're going to have a, a lit light bulb, okay, as a result of that. Now, if I ask the question, how much power de delivered to the light bulb, or maybe how much power dissipated by the light bulb? In other words, I want to calculate the power. Power dissipation, for example, or power delivered to light bulb. How much is that? Well, I know that power is equal to force times velocity. Remember that in mechanics? Force times velocity. Well, what is the force? Well, the force is this one. Uh, whoops, what is it here? So this becomes I L B V. There we go. I have an expression for uh, the power. I can go one more, one further, uh, and that is, if I go back, if I'm going to write it in terms of the resistor, see, I have, let me just, uh, let me just, let's say I want to eliminate I here, okay, I want to eliminate I right here. Ohm's law says E equals IR, remember E is what, BLV right there. B L V equals I R. I want to eliminate I. Got that? So I in this case is going to be equal to oops, B L V, excuse me. B L V. So in this case, I is equal to B L V over R. So now I can go back and take this I and put it right there. So therefore the power delivered to the light bulb is going to be equal to B L V over R times B L V is equal to b squared 
L squared V squared over R. Got it? And of course, one more step before I move on. Uh, what is BLV we said? It's BLV is just the uh, the EMF, so it is EMF squared over R, which I'm not surprised. I know that power is equal to V squared over R, from my understand, right? Also, power is equal to IR also. So there we go. We came full circle. We actually derived that. There it is right here. Okay. Um, I think this is the topics that I wanted to talk about. This is pretty much it. Um, if you understand what I have just said, uh, you are good, good to go. So let me do uh, at least two problems. What's, what's that time now? Okay. Uh, the homework problem that you have, <clears throat> let me take a sip. Um, let me go back to the book. Uh, some of the homework problem that you have is 13, 15, and um, these are two easy ones. I'm going to do 13 for you. I'll have you do 15. And then a big tough one is uh, the two tough ones, number 53 and 54. I'm not sure which one is homework for you. I'm going to do 53, and I'll let 54 for you, either as homework or exercise. But they're very similar to each other, both hard. Uh, but they're very similar. If you know one of them, you should be able to do the other. Okay, so the two problems that I'm going to do, like I said, number 13 and 53. And if I have time, if I am still uh, not tired, I will do 56. I believe 56 is also homework. Okay, let's start with number 13. Oh, let me go to the book. <clears throat> number waiting for the darn thing to open. There we go. Um, chapter 30, right? There we go. The e-book look very different from the actual book. I, I like the, uh, the actual book in, the, in print looks better, prettier than the e-book. Uh, it's it typed differently. But anyway, number 13. There it is, right here. Like I said, I think it's homework. Let me drag it as much as possible to keep it, but keep it within the frame of the video. It's probably right there, good enough. And then I'll move it this way. Whoop! But anyway, let me move that first. Number 15. Uh, I'm sorry, 13. There it is, okay. Uh, look at this picture right here, guys, okay? It says a loop is being pushed. There we go. So you get that... Uh, so it's being pushed in this direction, okay? Similar to the we were, we were just talking about. Uh, with a velocity, okay. Uh, it's being pushed into a 0.2 Tesla magnetic field at a velocity 50 meter per second. The resistance of the loop, okay, which is R, you know, just like a light bulb or something, is 0.1 ohm. Think of it like there is a light bulb here or whatever. Uh, what are the direction and magnitude of the current in the loop? So you want basically I, okay? So this one, I think, is a little bit simpler than the problem that we have just been doing. So let's do it. Again, always draw the free body diagram. Why do you draw it? It's because actually it really helps your brain see the problem better. Trust me on this one. Uh, number 13. So what I have here is a loop. Ah. I'm trying to make it as vertical as possible. Anyway. There we go. Okay. And so here is the magnetic field region here. And it is out of the page. Okay. Out of the page like that. And uh, so it's being pulled with velocity of 50 meters per second. B is equal to 0.2 Tesla, and um, and of course, uh, you know what? Let me uh, if I can do it. Uh, maybe not. Okay, so this is is being pulled 
and if uh, of course when I'm being pulled and of course here as you can see let me use the mouse this area right here is changing okay you always when you solve a problem like that say I always ask yourself what's changing okay uh, is it the magnetic field changing is it the angle changing or is it the area a lot of times the area it looks like so this is the area changing right and so this is what it produced the EMF so the EMF of course once you get the EMF E then you'll get I it's simple Ohm's law you're done so the whole goal here is just to get the EMF uh, the, and the, the make sure you under you know which what's staying changing well what's changing here is basically the area correct so here if I'm gonna call it and this length right here okay is the variable X right because it's changing but the, this side of the loop is constant what did I call it do we have the side of that oh yeah it's given to us five centimeters see that right there okay so we have that five centimeters okay so um all right so what is the direction of the current in this case before I give you the direction let's get the EMF so EMF is equal to uh, d phi dt right uh, let me get phi phi is what b a cosine theta we're going to ignore cosine theta because there is uh, they're both perpendicular to the plane the magnetic field per perpendicular to the plane of the loop so there is no issue here so in this case phi is equal to b a b is a constant of course he gives it to us actually just a number so there's no big deal here the uh, the troublemaker is the a what's a is equal to well length times width so it's just going to be b times 0.05 x yes so therefore e is the derivative of that and it's going to be what 0.05 b x dot which is the velocity right so that's going to be 0.05 b v and guess what b is uh, v is given to us see how easy it is if you just do it slowly okay so in this case i can find the emf and it is equal to 0 0.05 times the b is 0 0.2 tesla times the velocity is 50 meter per second is that it 50 meters yes and you calculate that and then you will get Point five volt, so half a volt. There we go. Okay. Now we ask him what is the induced EMF, I and D. Well, it's just E over R, right? So it just becomes uh, uh, what is it? Uh, point five divided by R. R is what? Point one. And that will give us uh, five amps. The induced EMF. Simple. Got it. Okay. Uh, now he says, "What are the? What is the direction? We got the magnitude. Fine. Now he wants the direction. Well, how does that work? Okay. The way it works is the following: is that the the induced EMF would work in such a way that to oppose the current, the the the, the value of the magnetic field. See, the magnetic field is in this direction, out of the page. Okay. The induced EMF. Let me just take this out." The induced EMF, or sorry, the induced current, will be created in such a way it will produce a magnetic field in the opposite direction. Now, if I use Ampere's law, which direction of a current will produce that? Here. Here's a current going. Go back to Ampere's law, previous chapter. What's the direction of the current uh, of the magnetic field in this case, using the right-hand rule? This way. Is that right? Yes. See that magnetic field. So if the current is going, I want to get the direction of the current in such a way that this is out uh, into the page. So it's going to be this way. Think about it for a minute. So in this case, the current is going in this direction. And that would be what clockwise. So the direction of the current is clockwise. Same question, number 15, kind of ask the same stuff. So I'll have you do it. All right, next problem. 
this one is really long two and a half pages long number 53 so pay attention okay let's do number 53 let me go back to the book Okay, it says here, here is a problem right here, number 53. Here's the diagram. Make sure you read it uh, while looking at the diagram. All right, he says uh, a square loop, so this is a square loop, okay, tilted by 45 degrees, right? A square loop shown in the figure moves into a 0.8 Tesla, here it is, a magnetic field at a constant velocity of 10 meters per second, okay? So it's moving at 10 meters, let me make it a little bit smaller, bigger. at 10 meters per second, okay? The loop has a resistance of 0.1, all right? Good. And it enters the field at time equals zero, okay? So it, the, the, the tip right here, the tip of the loop enters the field right here at time equals zero. All right, here's the question. Find the induced current in the loop as a function of time, okay? Give your answer as a graph of I versus T from 0 to 0 0.02 second. And then the next one, he said, what's the maximum current? Okay. And what is the position of the loop when the current is a maximum? All right, let's discuss this problem. It's not the easiest problem in the world, but it's not terribly hard. It took me a while when I remember reading it a long time ago. I kind of sat down and uh, thought about it for a while, trying to figure out how to do this one. But here is how it works. All right, let me let me draw it in my own way. So this is number fifty-three. Always draw a free body diagram to help your brain think about it. So here is the region, the boundary of the region. I'm going to draw it at least twice or three times, uh, just to show you. Each one has a different uh, thing in it. So here is the uh, magnetic field into the page. I'll come back to the numbers later. For now, I need to find how, how in the world I'm going to do it. Okay, so it again, this is square, but it's tilted by 45 degrees, as you can see. I'll try my best to make it as accurate as possible. There we go. It doesn't look bad. Okay, so this is 10 by 10, <clears throat> 10 centimeters, that is, and then it's moving with velocity v. Is that okay? All right, now here is what happens. Look what will happen. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna draw it when it enters the field. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm gonna draw it like this. So I have here, <clears throat> I'm gonna draw only the tip, you know what I mean? Only this part right here, see that? Because I want to show you something. So um, then I'm gonna, uh, and I'm gonna also magnify it. So it's gonna look something like that. And it is 90 degrees. Uh, you know what I mean, right? It's. I hope you get that. So here we go. Remember, this is 90 degrees. Remember, it's a square. So that means because it's moving at constant speed, you agree with me that this side is equal to this side. Do you agree with me on that? Why am I doing all this? I'll show you in a minute. Well, the reason I'm doing it, because he asked me a tough question. He said, find the current as a function of time. Okay, this is kind of tough. It's like, all right. So I, I, need, I need to look at it slowly. Now I'm gonna go even another, another diagram further. Okay. Now I'm gonna draw the same one that I have just drawn, this one. But this time I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the triangle that has just remember this has, this triangle has entered the field for a duration of time t arbitrary time you know whatever some time t you know whatever whatever the time is but I know that the tip reached the field at t equals zero and then after some time t now it is here and this it looks something like that well here it is I'm gonna draw this again I'm gonna draw this again okay so I'm gonna look something like that.
Bear with me. It looks something like that. There we go. This is where the field is, right? This is the field. Okay, that's the field region right there. I'm not dotting it anymore. Okay, so this, uh, as we said, this, this, and this are equal. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw a line here. Remember, this is 90 degrees here. This is 90 degrees. So this makes it 45, and this 45, you agree with me, guys? Okay, and now I have this thing. I, have, I put this line here. This also 45. So now I have this one is 45, and this one is 45. And therefore, that makes it an isosceles triangle, which means this side is equal to this side. I know the picture doesn't show it, but those two sides are equal. Why in the world I'm saying that? Well, here is why. Because, okay, what's changing here? See, I, I need, he said find the current, remember? He said find the current. All right, well, I know, I, which means I have to find the EMF, which is d phi dt. I'm, I'm just telling you what my brain is thinking. Okay, and phi is what? BA. Forget about theta. Theta is constant here. BA. Well, B is constant. He said B is equal to some number. He gives you, he gives you the number, right? Yeah, 0 0.8. So then the troublemaker here is A. And A, obviously, as you can see here, is changing. It's increasing. Well, I need to find an expression for A. And, you know, A is not that simple because it's kind of tilted. Not like the old A that we solved in the previous problem. This one is kind of a little bit hard. So I have to find an expression somehow. So I'm analyzing it in this sense. So I'm looking at it in this sense. Okay. Now, well, what is, here is the thing. So what is the area here, this whole thing? Well, let's see. Let me look at this triangle, the upper triangle. Since this is the same, uh, uh, I mean, this is an isosceles triangle, which means this side and this side are equal, that means the area of one of the triangles, the area of the one of the triangles, is equal to half the base times the height, right? You know, the simplest form. So that will be half. What's the base? The base is right here. Well, that's equal to that. If I call this y, and this is x, so it's equal to 1 half y times x, but y equals x, because it's an isosceles triangle, 45, 45, right? So therefore, the area is really 1 half x squared. Now, what about the entire triangle? This side and this side. Well, in this case, the area really is... 2 half x squared and that's equal to x squared if I call it x squared right you got that okay now back to the to the uh, to what's given to us okay so go back he says it's moving with velocity v. Can I call it v naught if you don't mind? So it's moving with velocity v naught. Okay? And as time goes by. So, and uh, we said that this distance is x here. So therefore, this x is really v naught t. Make sense? Think about it. You can pause the video and think about it. But x really is that. So therefore, I can say that the area is v naught squared t squared. There it is. Okay. This is probably the hardest part about the problem. All right. So now I'm ready to find an expression for the EMF. The EMF is just d phi <coughs> dt. Actually, I'm ready to get to phi first. So phi here is equal to ba. So that will be b v naught squared t squared. Right? So in this case, d phi dt, which is d dt of b, v naught squared d squared. He said in the problem that the velocity is constant, so I can take it out, and the, of course the magnetic field is constant, so that's b v naught squared times 2t. So therefore, 2b v naught squared t. 
that's the EMF. As you can see, I'm getting really close of getting that current. Well, the current is equal to what? Well, Ohm's law. E is equal to IR, so therefore I is the EMF over R, and this gives me 2B V naught squared over R T. There we go. He said, so the current here is a function of time. I of T is equal to 2B V naught squared over R T. And there we go. That's what I have. Make sense? All I need to do now is just plug in the numbers to get that. He said, go back to the problem. He said, find the induced current, I, in the loop as a function of time. Give your answer as a, uh, in the graph. Okay, we'll come back to the graph in a sec. So let me find it. So there's going to be I of T is equal to 2, B is 0.8, times V naught, which is 10 meters per second squared, divided by the, ra uh, the uh, not the radius, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, resistor, 0.1. Isn't it 0.1? Point 0.1, one? Point one, right. So it's going to be 0.1 here. Uh, and then times, again, I don't know T, it's a function of time, so just leave it there. And then when you calculate that, let's do the calculation very quickly. That's going to be uh, 100 times 0.8 times 2 divided by 0.1. Answer, 1,600 T. So here I have 1,600 T. I'm not done yet, but that's the first part. This is part A. He said, find the, find the induced current in the circuit, in the loop, excuse me. Uh, give your answer as a graph. Okay, now the graph problem. Okay, what's going on here? Watch. Again, I want to go back to this, uh, to the diagram here. So I want you to look at this and run, oh, this one, this one's probably a better picture. Look at this, <clears throat> and run a picture in your head. Run the movie, sorry, <laughs> run a picture in your head. Run a movie in your head. In other words, put this loop into motion and have it into the field, okay? So what's happening, as it is enters the field, you'll have this picture. The area is increasing, correct? And it will keep increasing until it reaches the peak right here. After that, is it increasing or decreasing? Well, the area is still increasing, correct? But not as much as before. You see what I'm saying? In other words, as it it reaches the the diagonal, if you will, right here, beyond that, the current will start decreasing. Because the area now is getting, uh, I mean, it's still increasing, but the rate of increase is decreasing, okay? So here, what will, what will happen is that the, the current will start decreasing. In other words, I want to find what is the maximum current? Here's the question. What is the maximum current? Or in other words, when does it occur? When does it occur? And I want to know also the, the value of the current. When does it occur? There's no E there. Right? When does it occur? Well, think about it. Let me go back and draw the same picture again. Here is the loop. trying to make it perpendicular to uh, each side. And now, here is the region. Well, it occurs when it, sorry, it occurs when it reaches this, this point here. Well, and this is, of course, the side here is what? Uh, 10 centimeters, right? 10 centimeters. Well, what is the, and of course the angle here is 45. What I'm, what I'm trying to do here is find the value of x at this point here. What is x here? Well, x in this case would be 10 cosine 45 degrees. 10 centimeters cosine 45 degrees. In other words, it is uh, 0.1 sorry, maybe I should make it uh, 10 centimeters here, uh, point one, uh, so point 0.1 times cosine 45, which is uh, 1 over square root of 2. 
You see what I'm saying? If this is if this is x, and the velocity is constant, and I know that x equals v naught t, so therefore t is equal to x over v naught. Remember, see when does it occur? When does the maximum occur? Okay. Well, at this t, t is equal to 0.1 over square root of 2 over v naught. I already know what v naught is, right? So I'm going to plug it in. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be uh, 0 0.1. 1 over square root of 2 is uh, 0 0.707 uh, o divided by 10. Is that right? And this, when I calculate that, this is the time where the current becomes a maximum. You see what I'm saying? 0 0.707 divided by 0 0.1. Uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.707. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit tired. 0 0.707 times 0 0.1 divided by 10. Answer, 0 0.0071. Second, which is basically, let me write it in simple terms, move the decibel uh, one, two, three, it becomes 7.1 millisecond. So at 7.1 millisecond, the current I is max. Well, what's the maximum value? Go back here. Here is the value of the current right there. So all you need to do is you plug in that time that I have just found, and it will tell you what's the value of the current. All right. So that's what I'm going to do. So maximum current is equal to 1,600 times T. So 1,600 times T is 7.1 times 10 to the negative 3 second, that is. And this will give me times 1,600, 11.3. So it, it, the maximum current is 11.3 Am. Okay? Now, how does the picture look like? It's going to look something like that. You remember, the current here is a linear function of time. Remember, the current says uh, I of T is 1,600 T, okay? But it, it's not, this T is not forever. It reaches at a certain point, and then it tapers down. So what's going to happen to it? It's going to look something like that. Here is 1,600 T. But and it reaches the uh, max at the uh, at the maximum value, and it goes down. It is exactly the same way, same slope except negative, like this. Where this I max equal eleven point three m as time goes by. In this course, this is the time. Uh, 7.1 millisecond. Okay? You got that? Okay. Uh, what is the maximum current? There we go. We have it already. What's the position of the loop when the current is maximum? We already answered all that. And then he said, give your answer as a graph versus 0 to point zero two. I'll, I'll let you do that. Uh, uh, I'll let you finish the rest of it. The rest of it is easy. But that's basically how you do this problem. You got it? Okay. One last problem that I'm going to work very quickly on. I'll just give you some hints. I believe it's homework as well. Let me go over it very quickly. And uh, I'll just give you a sketch of how to do it. It is also not terribly easy. Number 56. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit different. This is the problem that I'm talking about, if you want to play with it. I'm not sure if it's homework, though. Uh, but it's the same thing to get those two uh, wires and then one of them is separating from the other in that direction. So you have uh, the areas increasing. So it's kind of similar to it. If you need help with it, let me know. I, I mean, I can I can help you with it. But anyway, this is the problem we're talking about right here. Okay. Uh, number, what is, oh, I dragged it. There we go. Number 56 right there. Oh, bummer. It's also, there we go. Now you can see it. 
I thought it was outside the video screen. All right, it says here, let me make sure that it's within the screen of the video. It is, okay. So, uh, uh, here is the picture right here. So I'm going to read the problem and look at the picture. It says, uh, your camping buddy has an idea for a light to go inside your tent. He happens to have a powerful and heavy horseshoe magnet that he bought at the surplus store. This magnet uh, creates 0.2 Tesla field between two pole tips 10 centimeters apart. Okay, which is basically, I think, is this one here. Something like that. His idea is to build a hand-cranked generator, as you can see, <coughs> here is a crank right here. He thinks you can make enough current to fully light a 1 ohm light bulb rated for what? What's That's not super bright, but it, will, it should be plenty of light for routine activities in the tent. Uh, he said, find an expression for the induced current as a function of time. If you turn the crank at the frequency F, assume the semicircle is at its highest at T equals zero. With what frequency would you have to turn the crank for a maximum current to fully light the bulb? Okay, is this feasible? Okay, so it's not terribly an easy problem, I agree. But let's see how we do this. I'll give you just, like I said, I'm going to give you a sketch of how to do it. Here, think about it. The what's changing here? Remember, we're going to generate basically uh, current as a function of frequency and time, and we want to ask the question: What's being changed? What's changing here? What's changing here is the angle, theta. That's what makes it different. Okay. So I'm going to show you how to play with it. Uh, well, here is how. L let me let me draw it first. I'm going to draw the same picture. Here is a semicircle, the horseshoe thing, whatever it is. Like that and then he connects it with uh, a loop of wire like that there is a loop of wire here's a light bulb right there a lousy looking light bulb but anyway and then here's the crank right here's the uh, Okay, uh, the radius of the horseshoe is five centimeters, and the ma the magnetic field is out of the page, right? Oh, I get it. The you know, horseshoe is just outside. This is just a, a loop of wire. I get that. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't confuse you. The the uh, the horseshoe is not it's not uh, it's not the semicircle. Okay, okay, I, I misunderstood it. The whole, it just he brings in a wire, he turns it into a semicircle like that, so he can uh, you know crank it, he can t turn it around, and then the horseshoe is say the north pole is here and the south pole is there, whatever. Okay, and the resistance on the wire is one ohm, and then the uh, the power is four watts. Okay, these are the data that is given. Oh, and the B is uh, point. To Tesla. Okay, all right. So go back again. I just go back to basics. B a cosine theta. The area is constant, and the magnetic field is constant. The one that is changing is theta. Okay. Here is here is the trick, because he is uh, he is uh, uh, spinning uh, this thing, the semicircle. So he's spinning it with a rate of omega. See what I'm saying? Okay, and the ra the relationship between theta and omega is theta equals omega t. That's the one you want to use. Why do I want to use that? Because he mentioned uh, the frequency f. I know that omega is two pi f. So instead of saying that's the hint he's giving you, so theta is equal to two pi f t. That's the equation that we're going to be using. So I'm going to take that and plug it right there. Okay, all right. But he said frequency, he mentioned the frequency. So therefore, phi is equal to BA cosine 2 pi F T. Now, get the, um, well, let me get the, the, uh, the current. The current is what? Uh, EMF over R. 
and so let me find the EMF first. The EMF is what? D phi dt. Let me get that first. And that will be, again, B A a constant. Of course, the derivative of cosine is minus sign. And uh, we can eliminate the minus sign or, uh, you know, because there is a natural minus sign there. So we're going to ignore that minus sign. It just, it's not going to mean much. You can put it there, but it doesn't mean anything. There's no such thing as negative voltage. So we'll just ignore that. So that's going to be, um, how do I do this? It's going to be B A, what's the derivative of sine? Uh, cosine is minus sine. So time the derivative of the argument. So that's going to be 2 pi F sine uh, 2 pi f t. You see what I'm saying? So if I put a minus sign here, that's going to be a plus. Is that okay? Okay. And so this is the, whoops. Uh, so I uh, just clean it up a little bit better. So the EMF is equal to 2 pi f b a times sine 2 pi f t. Okay. And then therefore, I is equal to EMF over R, so that will be equal to um, 2 pi F. You know what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I forgot there is one more thing I need to do. Hold on. I'll come back. What I've done is not wrong. I just want to go one more step. What is A? Well, A is the area of the loop, which is pi R squared over 2. So I have 2 pi F B pi R, the radius, squared over 2, it's a semicircle, remember, sine 2 pi f t, and the 2's cancel out here, and then the pi becomes squared, so it becomes um, f b pi squared r squared sine 2 pi f t, is that right? There we go, there's the emf. Now remember, what did he ask? I forgot what he asked. Uh, Find that expression for the induced current. All right, I got the induced EMF. So as a function of time, is that right? And the induced current is a function of time. And if you turn it with frequency f, we did that already. So everything, everything is fine. So therefore, it's the last step. It's trivial. Therefore, I, which is Ohm's law, so it's just going to be what to get this R right here, right, right there. So it becomes um, f. B pi squared R times sine 2 pi F T. Then you put in the numbers. You know what I mean? Put in all the numbers. And if you plug in the numbers, here is what you're going to get. Uh, you, 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 you'll do it yourself. You're going to get I as a function of time. Now remember, you don't know F. This F or this F, you don't know it. T is a variable, so you leave it as is. You don't touch it. So, but you do know B and R. So you, when you plug in the numbers, you're going to get the following expression. Four, I'm copying it from my notes. I have, I've solved this already. 4.9 times 10 to the negative 3 F times sine 2 pi F T. There we go. Okay. This is the inducing F. This is basically part A for that. Now, part B, he said, at, with what frequency? Well, you have to turn the crank for a maximum current. For a maximum current. What does that mean? I hate to give you a free, uh, free answer. What is a maximum current for part B? I think I'll leave it for you. Think about it. How do you get the maximum current? In other words, you're going to get an answer for that, a real answer. Then with that, you're going to get frequency equal to some number. You got it. But first, you need to ask the question, what is the condition for a maximum current? Given this is my, uh, the, the, an expression for the current as a function of time. So what is the maximum current? Okay? All right. I'll have you do this uh, part. And I think I'll stop here. Okay? Have a good week. Bye-bye.